From London to Leeds, Kent to Surrey, British diners love nothing more than a bowl of Indian curry. Forget chips served with battered fish. Chicken tikka masala is the UK's national dish. In every town in this country, there's like one or two uh, curry houses. But every week, the industry says two South Asian restaurants are closing down due to financial strains exacerbated by the pandemic. If there is no restaurant, there would be no high street, particularly in London. We need prompt action, otherwise we are in trouble. Join 101 East on a culinary journey across the UK to see why Britain is saying toodaloo to Vindaloo. I moved to England when I was really young, uh, about eight years. I love Britain because there's no boundary to what one can achieve. We see the hardship my father came through to make a landmark restaurant in the heart of London. So I like to keep this uh, tradition and the legacy for my father. Jakhed Syed is the proud co-owner of one of Britain's oldest surviving curry houses. Soon after migrating from Bangladesh, his father established Durbar back in 1956. Oh, hello. Good evening, Nick. Hi. How are you? Very good, thank you. Ever since, this tandoori restaurant has been an institution in the posh London district of Notting Hill. We have uh, customers who comes from afar to just dine with us. The key to our success is uh, consistency of the food that uh, my father started. It's still a family affair. Two of his brothers cook the curries in the kitchen, while Jacket and his other sibling were front of house. The Fab Four serve all the classics, from the super spicy Vindaloo to the much milder, very popular chicken tikka masala. In the early days, Durbar and the first wave of curry houses had to think creatively to win over British diners. They reinvented South Asian cuisine, cooking richer, sweeter curries with butter and less hot spices than used back home. Well, um, the dishes that we traditionally have it in Bangladesh, um, and the sauce is quite spicy, the sauce is quite thin, different, but uh, the people here, uh, they like the thick, mild sauce, creamy sauce. Sybil Priestnell is one of Durbar's most devoted customers. So, Sybil, what do you like for tonight? I would love chicken orient. The 93-year-old eats at curry houses once a week. They're clean, they're tidy, they're, they're polite and they're quiet. And I've noticed that the, the ones I go in, or, or some who have got male waiting staff, I've had my birthday party here for the past 10 years at least. Can you explain to an audience watching at home what you think makes a good curry? Basically not too hot. Yeah. I will never have Vendaloo. I can vividly remember years ago some, somebody who was a bit unwise when he ordered Vindaloo without having the faintest idea what it's like. Mm -hmm. He found out. <laughs> well, what happened to him? <laughs> Keep in mind, traditional British fare is largely pies and mash. Food that's creamy, crusty, bland and battered, beef salted, or roasted. 
And don't get me started on Yorkshire pudding. From the mid 20th century, the good old fish and chip shop had a new competitor. 12,000 curry houses across the UK, run by a growing South Asian diaspora. They changed the palate of a nation, and this is very inspiring. What do you think is the secret to their success? The food tasted better, simply put. They bought in the heat, they bought in chilies. If you talk to anyone in their 60s and ask them what was the most exciting meal they had, it was their first time they went to have a curry. As Khan is a revered Indian-born British chef who founded Darjeeling Express, a popular upscale London restaurant with a team of female chefs. Usually they don't trust me to do this, that I might burn it. She says the South Asian food scene is critically important because it employs 100,000 people and contributes $5 billion every year to the UK economy. So this is not something that you, know, you can dismiss and disregard. The thing is that the impression that our food is cheap and cheerful, ethnic food, smacks of racism. And I'm saying it. Because the whole idea that you know, someone's cuisine is more elevated and more sophisticated, they all tend to be Western cuisines. This really upset me, and I wasn't going to have a conversation. I just priced it really high. Perhaps such perceptions exist because the quintessential curry house experience in Britain is not always a high-class affair. Indian restaurants establish themselves as affordable late-night haunts, welcoming walkers' patrons from pubs and nightclubs. The word curry was used as an umbrella term to describe the saucy, spicy concoctions on offer. Asma migrated from India in the 90s and describes her first dining experience in a British curry house as a culture shock. Well, I just thought it was just so hideously decorated. Someone's house looked like this you know, in my childhood and there was just so much cream and so much sugar. I just was just amazed that there were all these white people eating this and loving it. And I was like, you know, what are they thinking? What are they eating? South Asian men migrated to Britain during the economic boom of the 50s and 60s, filling labour shortages in the textile industry. When civil unrest triggered the violent split of the British Raj into India, Pakistan and Bangladesh, more families came to Britain and the diaspora kept growing. When factories went bust, these migrants set up Indian restaurants and other small businesses. They started in a very, very racist 1960s England, where they couldn't get jobs, where they, you know, people wouldn't rent them houses, where they couldn't raise finance. And this was their way forward. They set up an empire in this place, you know, using food as a way out. This is remarkable. And unfortunately, too many people ask questions, you know, this is not authentic, you know, you know, talking of mocking the food that they, they cooked. I will never criticize them, and I stand on the shoulders of those giants. Unique enclaves emerged across the UK around famous curry house precincts like Brick Lane. Raju Vigyanathan was born here and has lived all of his life in this iconic part of East London. His father arrived from India during the 40s and was one of the first curry chefs who trained other migrants how to cook around Brick Lane. The identity of Brick Lane from the late 70s, 80s onward was with the curry houses. My dad died in the mid 80s um, when I was young. Um, I said, look what you've done. You've, um, you're the reason why there's so many restaurants opening up here. They brought in chefs, uh, waiters, they brought in grocery shops, butchers, and so it became the centre point of the community. Everybody I knew I grew up with were chefs, you know. I didn't know anybody who was not a restaurant worker. As a 12-year-old, I started working part-time in restaurants. I'd be peeling the potatoes, chopping the onions and washing the pots, you know. And I still think about all these things. It just runs through my mind. Mm -hmm. 
After working in restaurants, Raju picked up a camera in the 1980s and has been a prominent photographer around Brick Lane ever since. Capturing a precinct fondly called Bangla Town during its heyday. At its peak in 2010, there were nearly 70 curry houses around Brick Lane. Now, only 20 remain. We're outside the latest one to close its doors. They've suffered, obviously, um, lack of business, and then the pandemic hasn't helped at all. How does it feel to hear that, you know, what, two curry houses a week are shutting down across mm. Britain? Um, it's, I mean, I just personally feel that um, the legacy that my father was part of is now dying. It just makes you feel that it's um, coming to an end. There's something um, a traditional British part of life. After 33 years, Raj Darwood's curry house hot stuff is shuttered. With no frills hole in the wall, it was an affordable, hip place to go. Even celebrity chefs Anthony Bourdain and Gordon Ramsay dropped in. On a Friday night, what was this place like? It was crazy nice, really. Uh, people getting drunk, people dancing on tables, and well, that's what people loved about it. It wasn't just like sitar music and people in fake suede waistcoats and bow ties. There was no airs or graces. Even when you, when you come to hot stuff, you're like everybody else. We had a cult following, as, as everyone always says to us. The pandemic ended the party. Lockdowns pushed small businesses like Hot Stuff into financial strife. Raj says his clientele disappeared as London became the ghost town. So it was a big hit for us. And there was times when we, when we sat there all night and literally had two or three customers for the whole evening. It's a sad end of an era. Raj, now 49, began working with his mother here as a teenager. Today, all of the signage is being removed from the restaurant. My mum put blood, sweat and tears into it. It's double emotional because um, my mum is the one who started it all off uh, in 1988. And then uh, I lost my mum five years ago. There's a lot of things going through my mind seeing that. It's more about my mum's legacy. So I didn't lose the business. I lost family, I lost friends because I spent most of my time here. Eight out of 10 curry houses here are owned by Bangladeshi migrants. Restaurateur Tofaz Ol Mia advocates on their behalf. There are many challenges, but one of them we're facing is a shortage of staff which includes cleaners, porters, call waiters and waitresses. Before Britain voted to leave the EU in 2016, Indian restaurants were struggling to bring in experienced curry cooks from South Asia due to visa restrictions. The pro-Brexit movement carried favour with the South Asian community by promising easier immigration rules. At the time, did you support it? Well, look, I'm not going to shy away from it. I was sold the dream, but that promise is broken. It turned out to be a false information and a pack of lies. While the British government has now eased some visa restrictions for South Asian cooks, it's still difficult for restaurateurs to bring in other hired help. High taxation on hot foods, rises in rents and food prices are other reasons why a third of curry houses across Britain now face closure. The cost is rising day by day, but I'm hoping the government will listen to us and act fast. Due to such pressures, the children of restaurateurs are largely uninterested in taking over the family business. Um, I've got a car dealership. Tofazul's sons, Tamim and Fahim, have university degrees and would rather pursue other opportunities than toil away in the kitchen. Me and my brothers truly spent a lot of time actually helping within uh, the restaurant and the takeaway, spending our weekends there as young 16-year-old kids. It's not exactly 
the, what you want to be doing on your Friday and Saturday nights. Um, I think it ultimately boils down to opportunity. I'd rather sort of um, go for a corporate job. It definitely is difficult to run your own business. You can't switch off. I mean, my dad, for example, there were years where he wouldn't go on holiday. However, for example, in a corporate job, I have 25 days leave. Do you feel sad that n none of your sons want to inherit and continue the, the family business? It's a kind of one way, yes. A little bit disappointing that they don't want to follow uh, my uh, footstep and my uh, small legacy I built over the 30 odd years. But I'm happy for them because they're going about their career and they're trying to be successful in their own way. Britain, Enam Ali is known as the Curry King. He's amassed wealth, status, and even a royal honour, building up the Indian restaurant sector here. At his high-end eatery, the Bangladeshi migrant concedes that South Asian families don't see the restaurant game as a respectable career for their children. Within our community, if my son becomes a waiter, it's a failure. Our children don't want to be chef. To address staff shortages, he worked with the UK government to establish one of five curry colleges that train British workers in the art of cooking Indian cuisine. Less than 30 students entered the whole program and it ended up being a massive failure. All of them are saying, I don't mind to be a chef, but I don't want to be a curry chef. So it was a very difficult for me to continue. It was almost you know, two years I waited and I have to close. Enam has two Romanians working in his kitchen and believes Europeans can be trained to cook delectable South Asian cuisine. The question is, will diners see a white chef's curry as authentic? You know, you would be just put in your mouth and say, oh, is it, is it right? Even though he's, he's doing a best dish maybe, so it takes time. Today's Britain is a land of culinary diversity and gastronomical wonder. Come to any food market across London, it's clear that curry is no longer the only exotic offering. This is also the case in Manchester's famous Curry Mile. Diners are spoilt for choice, with plenty of unique dishes on offer to tingle the taste buds. Brits are also increasingly ordering takeaway using delivery apps, a trend that's accelerated during the pandemic. You're probably thinking by now that the curry crisis is about as gloomy as a British winter. But there are some people here in the South Asian dining and catering scene who are adapting to the changing times. And that's what's brought me here to Birmingham. Natisha Patel is a consultant who's helping the local food sector adapt to changing tastes. She set up a cloud kitchen called Darlings in mid-2021 serving Indian vegan food for the growing takeaway market. And there are various kitchen units that you can rent out. You mm -hmm. pay a monthly fee. Now, this one on the left coming up, this is Darling's Kitchen. This is the one I've taken on. Also commonly known as dark kitchens, these businesses without shop fronts are booming as more people get their meals delivered. It enabled me to showcase my menu to the city, to showcase my food, but with a quarter of the costs. We don't have to cover the cost of waiting staff, restaurants, a bar. We don't need to pay for any seating area. All we pay for is our rent, our ingredients, and our salaries of the staff. Natisha's local staff learned to cook the small menu in a two week course. So our menu is probably the size of a quarter of a normal curry house menu. And as a result of that, our chefs have the time to spend a little bit more time and quality on the dishes that they produce. Many of Darling's plant-based dishes originate from the Indian state of Gujarat, where Natisha's family is from. This is childhood, this is nostalgic, it reminds me of my mum, 
It's all things comfort. This is what I grew up eating. It's phenomenal. She calls this curry an aubergine pea and potato pot. I'm not a fan of the word curry. I believe that every dish is different. I don't like umbrella terms that push everything under the same boat. OK, guys, we've got a check on. Natisha says curry houses need to move with the times. I think in 30 years' time, unfortunately, we won't see many of them. If the industry doesn't move forward now, it's going to be too late. They need to reinvent their menus and their eating habits now. I do see an increase in smaller Indian restaurants that specialise in regional cuisine. And it's time we celebrated those cuisines as opposed to an umbrella term of Indian curry. In Sheetal, a small village outside Manchester, I'm braving the bitter cold to experience one such restaurant. Devan Gohil is the owner of Budji Pala, which opened here in 2019. So, Tandoori pineapple, yeah. one of very unusual, but one of the most popular dishes on our menu. His restaurant serves cuisine inspired by Western India. And I went to my team and I said, you know, we're going to open a vegan restaurant. And I had to literally, I had to fight everyone to open this restaurant. They literally thought that, you know, opening a vegan restaurant, we would lose 75% uh, of our audience. On weekends, Bhaji Parlour is booked out. Their award-winning innovative menu features curries made from beetroot, eggplant and tofu. Do you think a British consumer will eat a butter chicken without the chicken? Like They're already doing it. We are so popular. So we got uh, tofu makani, which is like a butter chicken. It took us 17 different tofus to find the right tofu. Devang believes diners now recognise the complexity and diversity in regional South Asian food that goes beyond chicken tikka masala. I think what we have seen from Indian world in UK still is hardly 20-30% of Indian food cuisine. There's so much variation to come in future, you know. Another break from tradition is how Devang runs his business. Starting in the big city from the bottom as a dishwasher, he's seen family-run curry houses treat their employees like cheap labour, an attitude that doesn't work in a time of staff shortages. I've seen a lot of families running businesses like, you know, how would you run a house? I used to see chefs and owners fighting a lot, and I've seen chef on a Saturday night, business service, throwing his apron and just walking out. Yeah. What marination do you want to do with it? So you, I want to make just like, you know, uh, green spices. Uh... Most of my chefs are either partners with me or they're on a very good commission structure with us so that um, if they had to go out and look for a job, they would probably not get a same paycheck. I make sure if I'm making money, people around me make money as well. What would you say to the owner of a curry house that is struggling? I'll tell what I did. I took a risk. I've been adventurous. We did something which was completely different to others. And, you know, it has hit the spot for us. Those who push the boundaries often garner national praise. The UK has a number of awards that celebrate the very best South Asian cuisine, including the British Curry Awards. It's Curry's Night of Nights. There's the red carpet, the stars, the restaurateurs. It's no wonder they call this event the Curry Oscars. In 2005, Enema Lee started this event to elevate and motivate the industry. People lobbying for the one single ticket to be here, to see the showcasing of the curry industry. Look at our star, will be, tonight will be the winner. One of the winners could be the Fab Four. Yes, those brothers from Durbar are nominated for a curry Oscar tonight. We hope we'll get it. We worked together all these years, and this is going to be like an um, icing on the cake. There's a smorgasbord of entertainment and no surprises as to what's on the menu. In this competition, customers nominate their favourite curry houses. Then judges award the best restaurants by region. It really means a lot to the restaurant. Uh, he can promote and let his customers know that he's the best of the best. So, did Durbar win? And the winner is Benares. Jacket puts a positive spin on the result. A lot of people win the awards and they are happy and 
but end of the day what counts is the customer they're your loyal customer they will come to your restaurant they're 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 the best critic you can get the family run restaurant not in amali says tonight is dedicated to the unsung heroes whose cuisine captured a nation's heart because my grandfather father generation nobody said thank you because of them i'm here and i tribute them once upon a time the curry was like a ugly duckling. Now it's become a beautiful swan. Whether a classic vindaloo or a vegan beetroot dish, curry, with all its spice and flavour, has transformed the way the British eat. From cheap and cheerful curry houses to the high-end diner, these South Asian restaurants are all evidence of what migrants can achieve with delectable dishes and a dream.